All right, we're back. We're back. <laughs> to the first public meeting of the Pema Chodron Fan Club. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know it was that. That's so good. I forgot. Yeah. Um, have you Have you started reading the book? I, I have. I, I'm about I'm about halfway through, but it's it's sort of like when I can think of it. I read totally. It. I, like it. I like it. So it's we're dense gonna... though. But yeah, it is. it's very dense and tiny little print. Like there's a lot of words in that book. Lots of so many I words. A lot to say. So many words. About. Anyway. For anyone who's watching who didn't watch that episode, by the way, uh, the, what we're talking about is the book Living Beautifully with Uncertainty and Change, which is one of my favorites. And Pema Chodron mm -hmm. is the best. And she's like this badass New Yorker, 80 year old Buddhist nun with a shave head, who shaved head, who lives in Nova Scotia. And yeah. she's just about as Zen as they come, not Zen in the school of Buddhism, but, you know, in the sort of cool heel. Yeah. yeah. Cool as yeah. hell. So Very I'm sure that will come up today. To so today's topic. Oh, by the way, for those of you who are unaware, I don't know how you've been aware. <laughs> Next to me is Lauren Rosen, my licensed marriage and family therapist from the great state of California and my now frequently monthly collaborator. We do these once a month. We pick a topic and we yammer about it for about 20, 30 minutes. So welcome. And this? Back. Oh no. I I you mirrored us. I thought I was going to get it right, man. This is Drew Linsalata. He's the dot anxious dot truth on Instagram. And he's awesome. And he's got books and podcasts. And check him out if you're here from my page. Um, yeah. yeah. So today we're going to talk about, uh, this is a topic we stumbled upon about an hour ago. And yeah. this is something that I found interesting when I was reading through some of the Marty Seif and Sally Winston's books. Hmm. Um, I think it was the intrusive, th intrusive thoughts book. And they talked about this. Like a, a stressed out when, when you, we get stressed out, intrusive thoughts tend to get stickier and louder mm -hmm. and harder to handle. And I mm -hmm. thought, Ooh, this is a thing that I had never considered, but, and I think certainly I'm sure you see it in your practice specializing in OCD, but I think at all the anxiety disorders, this becomes a thing. I, every single day I see it, such and such happens, something terrible happened. I lost a pet or, or my marriage is breaking up or whatever it is. And now I'm back to square one in my recovery. It yep. happens. So this is clearly a thing. Stress will do that to us. Yes, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know about you. I was thinking about it. I have a lot of personal lived experience of this as well, that I can look back in the times in my life when my anxiety has flared back up and I've resisted it, have been at times of increased stress. And even down to the first flare up, of my life that I, you know, it retrospectively can say, oh, that was likely to be OCD or anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Do, do you have similar experience? Yeah. I, I think one of the things that I learned along the way to recovery, which for me was panic disorder or the agoraphobia, um, I discovered that every stress in my life instantly morphed into panic and fear. So no matter mm -hmm. what I was feeling, if it's something that made me angry within 30 seconds, I was afraid. If it was something that made me really upset or something sad within 30 seconds, I was just afraid. So wow. for me, I saw, I, I saw that the, uh, that link between sort of stressful situations or stress triggers and fear that way, it just, everything would immediately morph into, Oh, now I'm afraid here comes a panic attack. That's so, so fascinating. Yeah. And as I went through the process that happened less and less, but it would still happen. It just started to fall away, but it was the propensity mm -hmm. was still there. And yeah. Yeah. And I see it now in the community where people will say, oh, I've been doing so great. I've been doing great for three or four months and really on, on a good trajectory. And then such and such happened. And for the last week, I got sick or I got, got COVID or whatever it happened. Mm -hmm. And now I'm right back to square one. Yeah. 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 But, and of course, as we've talked about before, it's not like you're actually back to square one because you never lose the the knowledge that you have. And yet what tends to happen when I, and what I see from others and what I've, I've experienced myself is that I forget, I revert back to this, let's resist anxiety. I don't want to feel this. I don't want to have this emotion and I don't want to have these thoughts. So let me, let me try and fix it again, which gets me stuck or yeah. it gets the people that I work with stuck. Um, but the idea of, of I've completely fallen back, it does, it happens a lot. Like uh, when there are big life changes, we see it a lot, I think, of relationship OCD or postpartum OCD and and where these flare-ups tend to happen around these huge life events. Like usually um, a significant relationship has initiated or you're having a child or right? like these are things that, that, that I think of that list 
I wish I had it where it's all of the stressful life events and it's Top got some sort of things that can happen. Yeah, but it's more than that. It's like this whole long list and it's got a numerical value assigned to each stressful event and says, mm-hmm. like, if you have above this score, right, like this is indicative of a large stressor. And it doesn't matter if it's the you stress or good stress uh, yeah. or distress or bad stress. It doesn't, it really doesn't matter in the end. Mm-hmm. No, nope, uh, I've seen people struggle. I don't have this experience myself, but I've seen a lot of people struggle, even when the stress is positively triggered in a way. Definitely. Like, oh, we bought a new house. We're moving to our dream house. And yet I'm a basket case now. Yes. Yeah. You know, moving is stressful for everybody, no matter where you're moving. So. Totally. Well, and then you fix the tendency to fixate on what's like getting everything right. If you have something that's this that lauded dream of yours that's coming to fruition, any small thing, it's like, I don't want to have this contaminated by the experience of panic or the experience of generalized anxiety or the experience of intrusive thoughts. So it, it's almost like and it happens on birthdays and holidays too. the additional stress of this now has to be perfect actually makes it more likely to be sticky because you're, in that initially resistant zone. Yeah. That's not, okay. That's interesting. I had not considered that before. It has to be perfect. That's why yeah. a good, good air called good stressor can be a problem also then, I guess. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it's one, one way to look at it and certainly something that I see come up with my clients. I think one of the things, and again, when, when reading about it in the Steve and Winston book, you know, the way they made it sound, which makes sense to me, fatigue, when you're fatigued, you're sleep deprived, you're, you're physically ill, you're under a large load of stress, life stress. And you said, you know, well, it's like I revert, you know, I revert mm-hmm. to the old habit of resisting. And I think a lot of people will misinterpret it as it came back, but I would agree with you. No, no, no. It, we, <laughs> the way we're relating to it, we've just gone back to old habits and I, we tend to fall back to old habits because we lose that resiliency that that we built somehow yeah. or other, it melts away for temporarily. And it's so normal. Okay. So it's like if you're learning a new sport, right? So I'll give an example. Hilariously, I have decided to play a little golf, not because I'm any good at it or particularly athletic, but because my stepsons and my husband are, are playing. So I'm like, all right, I'll give this a go. And, you know, you learn all of the specifics, like how to grip the club and how to swing and blah, 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 how to stand. Now, as soon as uh, it takes so much concentration when you're building this new habit, this new ability to uh, bring together all of these ideas and then all of a sudden some stress comes about. In fact, usually it's in the form of somebody staring at me (laughs) or (laughs) like watching me. Um, And all of a sudden it's like, it all goes out the window. And I think the same thing is true with the, the skills that we talk about using for anxiety and OCD are so counter to our sort of natural MO as human beings that when there's stress, of course we default back to like, no, I don't want to have this experience or, or have that tendency to default back anyway. Yeah. And I think our, our ability, because it does, what we're doing is work where it takes work to run counter to our instincts. And we just, I don't know, it's fatigue, it's cognitive load. It, I don't know what it is, but we just seem to lose that ability. And so it feel people will want to say it's back or I'm having a relapse or it came back or I'm back to square one, but really and truly that's not true it's just oh we reverted to some old habits yeah. because we lost the ability to be flexible and and flex those new muscles and use those new skills they, they just we forgot them yeah so, yeah we started to struggle again against it instead of accepting moving with it navigating life with it in tow that kind of yeah. thing yeah and it's interesting because you're right and you can see that in almost every you know every facet of life sports is a good example uh, it's interesting I was, I was watching a hockey game the other night naturally naturally back to our origins fire and ice <laughs> and you know one team is playing really really well and everything's going great they're dominating the game but as soon as the other team sort of shows up mm. and, and they pick up their game now now that first dominating team is under pressure they're under duress and it starts to fall apart how yeah. could that be the very same guys who were playing positionally perfect hockey five minutes ago are now playing like college hockey and they're getting killed how could this be yeah so that's so i think it's not this is not probably unique to the anxiety complex. It's probably just a, a human function in general. 
Absolutely. And trying to practice something that is counter, not necessarily intuitive yeah. um, under like stress golf. is hard. Yeah. Like golf, <laughs> like golf. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, but I think large stressors too. And I, this is why when, when I, when we were talking about it earlier and discussing what we were going to talk about, why I said I would immediately go to groundlessness and get all deep about <laughs> Pema Chodron, hence the, <laughs> the Pema Chodron fan club, is because what happens when, there, especially when there are large stressors, but honestly, it can be with any sort of stressor, we get in touch with the fact that everything is constantly moving. And when we're going about our lives and things are relatively unchanging, right? From day to day and we're in a habit, it there's a comfort to that. And there is this illusion that everything is always the same and safe and fine and everything's going to continue on the way it is. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden something changes and it's like, mm, what? Like uh, the, it cues you into the fact that we're, we're not standing on solid ground. Everything is constantly shifting and changing. And that just is a, a florid place for our anxiety and OCD to blossom. That's a really good point. It's like a slap in the face. Yeah. 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 Because I, I, I guess if you're being dragged around by anxiety and panic or OCD or compulsions, or intrusive thoughts all the time, you're just trying to find some stability there. Yes. And you manage to build it and then something yanks it away and you discover nothing is stable. Nothing. Right. nothing. And that's a hard, it's a hard realization to come to. It is. And it's the, the ultimate truth of life, right? There's never any stability. And the more, the quicker you can get to sort of dancing on the moving blocks that you're walking over instead of trying to make them stable mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's, it's not a possibility. It's like saying like, well, there shouldn't be any earthquakes. It's like, okay, try to stop an earthquake. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. So if you recognize, okay, the, the earth is going to quake sometimes. How do I learn how to walk over the earth as it's moving as opposed to not that I'm suggesting people should not take shelter. <laughs> There's an actual earthquake, but the metaphor. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. How how do we learn how to how to navigate shaky ground instead of trying to make the ground less shaky? So much of this, I think, if we go beyond anxiety and recovery, this is why we practice things. Mm -hmm. This is why we rehearse things. This is why teams practice so that when another team is pressing on them, they can mm -hmm. still perform even while under duress. And yeah. I think whether it's you're practicing your ERP and you're resisting of your compulsions or exposures, whatever it is, or just life in general, just practicing being resilient and, yeah. and walking on the moving blocks all the time, yeah. then we don't, we tend to not get taken by surprise, I guess, when it's right in their face. Totally. And I would add to that meditation practice. Mm -hmm. right? Mindfulness practice. It's the same. It's the same idea. How do I, how do I relate to things and how do I practice relating to things so that when things become challenging, that becomes more of the default or it's easier to pivot toward that. Um, yeah. And just because I know that I can get pretty esoteric, like to, to ground this in, in like the specifics, I feel like could be helpful and talk. So what does it mean to, move like move with the moving blocks or walk with the moving blocks versus trying to to hold the ground still if we look at panic disorder that looks like accepting the possibility that at any step along the journey you might stumble mm. and experience panic right that 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 might happen um that's what it is to accept that the blocks are moving is to accept that the feared outcome might happen that it's not necessarily right you've been walking for a while or you you maybe at some point in your life were walking for a long time without having panic mm -hmm. um but that if it does you'll navigate it as it comes as opposed to again getting down on your hands and knees and trying to hold the ground together which is a fool's errand and okay causes you more anxiety because you're like, why can't I do this? It should, right. I should be able to do this. Um, yeah. I think if you tie that into, you know, sort of the, the premise that we're talking about today too, when the blocks move, all the blocks move. So, mm -hmm. okay. The blocks of my panic disorder are moving because I had a panic attack again after six months of not having one, yeah. but all the blocks in my life move. So a stressful thing happened. I got sick or 
someone I love got sick or I lost someone in the family or I got a promotion at work or lost my job. All the blocks moved. Why would you think that only the job blocks are moving? Right. All, all the blocks are moving, including the anxiety and mental health blocks and, and relationship blocks. Everything moves. Yeah, actually, to that end, if you if we talk about it in the context of like postpartum OCD and the like all the blocks moving, it would be like expecting that you were going to have a child and that all of your life wasn't going to change around that. Yes, it that's really good. Would be ludicrous, right? Oh, it's possible, right, exactly. Yeah, because here's this thing that's completely shifting and learning how to navigate this this new setup of of the blocks and the moving and then as soon as you get used to it something else shifts something else changes which is why it's not about getting the blocks to stop move it's about learning how to dance on the blocks moving and it's so funny i find this this is a fascinating discussion i'm digging this because so many people if you ran some memes and cliches across them about this sort of thing like all of everything is connected to each other and life is one big holistic experience. It would be like, yeah, yeah, definitely. But then when confronted with that, well, I lost my job and the rest of my life rippled also. Oh, why that did wasn't that supposed to happen. <laughs> yeah, but you just, you just liked all those memes about life being one big connected holistic experience. But now you want to deny it when you actually have to live that. Yeah. I'm not picking on anybody, but it's just one of those things. And then you mis have that mistaken conclusion that like, well, all the blocks moved from under me. So therefore I have failed in my recovery and it's back and I'm having a relapse. No, just the ripples happen. Yeah. Including that. Yeah. 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 Oh, shoot. Something of what you just said to lit up something in my mind and then it, uh, Did I even tell your golf, golf clubs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I no, it's gone. It happens at least once one of these things now. It's it'll good. It'll, it'll come back, I'm sure. So all right, so then something happens. There's a shift in some part of your life. There's a stressful situation, some terrible event happens, or some great event happens, and the ripples go through your whole life and now you have an impact on your recovery or whatever you want to say it is. What do you tell somebody? What would you tell somebody? So I think a lot of it is in the way that we view these moments because I think that it can be viewed as an opportunity for practice. Mm. Yeah. I actually, honestly, some of the conversations that I have are a lot like the one we're having now are saying, yeah, look, you've touched into groundlessness. Here it is. It was here all along. You were sort of uh, blind to it. You weren't, it wasn't particularly apparent that everything was able to shift, but then things shifted and you're like, whoa, everything could shift again and again. What if it does? And the reality is, yeah, it might but we know that large shifts don't happen all that often. And so I guess we got to take a leap forward as though this is the new ground you're working with until it shifts again. Yeah. Okay. I dig that. I also dig, uh, then there's also that unrealistic expectation that some people might have that I, I you know, mm -hmm. I guess, and it's, I under, I understand this. I'm not picking anybody. If you're suffering, you know, for a while, you are trying to eliminate that clearly. We all, it's our nature. We want to do that. Yeah. And I think there's the reality that says, well, I'm just trying to create a stable, calm, like you said in the beginning, a stable, mm -hmm. calm, quiet life, no suffering, nothing. I don't want any of that. I'm trying to get rid of all of that. And th then I think these are the times when you get slapped in the face. No, sorry. You're, nobody gets out of this thing that way. You're still mm -hmm. human and you will have emotions and you will have reactions and you have to learn to integrate them again in a healthy way. So this yeah. isn't a failure. It's just now we're going to put another piece of the puzzle in here, I think. Yes, absolutely. The, yeah. yeah, you're you're just ha you have an, another chance to to reorient with with everything that is. And you're right. Nobody nobody gets out of this unscathed. Uh, no. uh, that groundlessness is is for everyone. So, and I think the judgment too of the situation, the situation itself. Can't I cannot allow this situation? I we're always trying to, you know, listen, you have no choice. It, judging the situation as this shouldn't happen or why do I feel this way? Well, you just you just lost someone close to you or something major happened in your life. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you feel this way? Of course, you're going right. to feel this way. Trying to not feel it at all is not like trying to hold the ground together. Yeah. So that's so unreal and un very unfair. People put that unfair expectation on themselves. It is. So, and I, I think part of it is the larger expectation that we should always have our stuff together, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah that's all this. What's that? Yeah. We should be able to control all of this somehow. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that when things are, are shifting, when we feel off kilter, that there's something wrong with that instead of, no, no, that's, that's what it is to be a person, right? Like it's not going away. It's okay. That's a really good point. And you know, that's a groundlessness thing. That's, there's, that's woven into so many different things. That's acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT acceptance. The acceptance part is that is a shared human experience. We yeah. suffer, we have problems, we feel things deal with it. This is what it is. And we don't get away. We don't get to not have that. So, yeah. you know, I think that that's a big part of this puzzle too, for a lot of people Then they forget, well, they get so, so caught up in feeling. And I understand mm -hmm. it becomes maladaptive that I don't want to feel anymore. Right. And they're hoping that the recovery process is teaching them to be almost robotic or not human anymore. Yeah, totally. Yeah, well, and this does. <laughs> one of the things that I, the thing I think I, I sort of lit up on before was this idea that even as we're talking about things, we we're making it sound like I say the word dance. And I like that because when I'm in it, I'm like, okay, I'm like going to dance with this. Like that, that feels good to me. But the reality is that we're talking about this in a broad way that doesn't sort of get at the fact that in the moment, what we're talking about is really being willing to open to something that is terrifying. It's not, it's not cute. It's not pretty. There's, it's not necessarily graceful. And so knowing that like the talking about this experience versus being in the thick of it, it's yeah, it's not always going to look shiny and, and cute. No, and I think people tend to also, they don't give themselves a fair shake because they're going to look to, you know, oh, what would Lauren tell me to do? My tools. I get asked all the time, how do I use my tools? Well, sometimes you don't. Like the tools are navigation tools. They're not tools of change. Yes. Tools of navigation. So yes. people they're maybe, not tools of eradicating, right? Correct, like, yeah, you're right. Like nobody, yeah. I'm teaching you to have like a flamethrower of emotion that you just, and that's it. Yeah. It's all fun. Like, <laughs> You know, your therapist isn't teaching you that at all. So I think sometimes people have an unrealistic or a skewed expectation that the tools, my tools, yeah, but the tools, you're still going to feel the feels. That's actually, feel. I, I love that so much. And it, it sort of hit me um, a metaphor that, that, mm -hmm. that in terms of looking at tools is as though you are navigating a stormy sea as a captain of a ship, right? You don't expect for your tools to make the sea placid. Oh, that's really good. That's really good. Right. Well, it was from you. I've bounced. Yeah. yeah what you have um, in your hand there is a rudder. Yes. Not, not a weather machine. Yes. Yeah. And you, and you might have, you might have, um, some information about the way that the waves are going and all of that. And you, you might be able to, you know, batten down the hatches, so to speak. I don't even know what that means, but that's a phrase. So whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Batten them down. So like, and the, what I imagine that would mean is like, what is just being like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to move through this. I'm going to, I'm going to wait this out knowing that storms always come and go, mm -hmm. but that we're not waiting for it to go. We're just learning how to navigate the ship while we're caught in the storm and yeah. in good weather. It's both. Yeah. And I think this, this storm analogy can be, oh man, we could use it for the rest of the time for sure. I think people yeah they will call themselves failures because the storm happened. Right. Also, like, but, yes. you, but you don't get to pick that, you know, and no. then maybe, right. You don't get to pick the fact that a storm happened in your life. You didn't make that. Uh, and I think sometimes they feel like, yeah, but it was there, but I saw it as if somehow they knew it or they could see it all the way there and they could run the other way. I ran or right into good. it. Right. So you, you don't get to pick that. You don't, that's not a failure having this happen. And, having maybe your OCD flare up or your thoughts come back or your panic symptoms go, it's not failure that you didn't fail at all. You're just living your life. Yes. Yeah. No, I love that. And I think the the idea that like, well, I saw it coming potentially, like I saw something I should have known and therefore I should have turned around. It's like, well, no, you don't want your, you don't want the storm to, to change your course. Not this particular one. Right. Are right? you going to, part of what you learn to do is to go through these. Right. Storm will otherwise be on your course. Right. Because right. otherwise yeah. you're just bouncing to and from and you're never getting to settle in a place that that you are not settle in a place. I mean, like you don't get to keep your course. You don't get to go to the places that you want to go. Right? You don't get to live in accordance with your values and your goals. Instead, you're bandied about by anxiety. Yeah, that, that's true. But but I think in the end, if you're doing this and I, I don't even want to use this word, but if you're doing it right, if, you know, air quotes, right, if, if you're if you're respecting the process and letting the process take you where you want to be and you're down the road to recovery, 
then you do get to live according, according to your values, yeah. what's important to you. And that storm blows through and you take on a little water and you get a little, you have a bad hair, hair day as a result and, blah, and all that stuff. But, but your values are still intact. And when the storm blows past, you're still going, you're still moving in your direction. Yeah. You want to go. That's it. That, yeah. That a little bit of an interruption. So the tools not- are to get you toward your goals and values, not to avoid storms. Correct. Yeah. They're, they're not teleporting you to your goals and values. You have to get there and there are going to be storms and potholes and detours along the way. And you, you learn to navigate through those. Yeah. That idea that tools are not tools of eradication. They're tools of navigation. But there's a bumper sticker in there somehow. Wow. I think you just said it. They're not tools of eradication. They're they're tools of navigation. There's uh, there's an Instagram post. Yeah, for- yeah, we'll do that together. We will do that. It's Samara's post for both of us. How's that? I like it. I like it. Yeah. Recovery tools are not eradication tools. They're navigation tools. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think, and I love what you said about the storm because so many people think it's their fault that they, they're back at square one because a storm arrived, which is just what? Yeah. No, no, you yeah, didn't do anything fair. wrong. You're right. living a life and storms hit all the time. And I think, you know, there's that realization also that if for somebody who's dealing with OCD or health anxiety or panic disorder, whatever it is, when a, when a ripple happens in your life because of some event that you cannot control nor predict, there, your ripple, you'll feel the ripple in your OCD or your panic disorder or your health anxiety. For someone else, they might feel the ripple in their gambling addiction or their alcohol mm-hmm. addiction or yeah. their whatever other bad choices they may make in life or other ways that they might begin to overeat. Everybody experiences the ripple. Somehow, this is where our ripples are. It doesn't well, make it your yeah. fault or, or failure. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know. It totally makes sense. I think that it's it's makes total sense because the, the, all of these mechanisms are ways for us to hold on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're all ways for us to like, we revert to, let's say OCD since we used panic disorder earlier, right? Like I'm going to revert to trying to figure out this one small element of my life, because if I figure that out, then everything else is going to be okay. Mm-hmm. As opposed to recognizing like, no, no, I'm just feeling uncertain right now. And Um, there's no amount of like, of trying to figure that out. That's going to get me the, the sort of ease throughout. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Even though that maybe there, you know, the ripple in this part of life will trigger the need to figure out a completely different part of life. Yes, exactly. That'll calm everything down. I'll fix that. I can't fix this. I'll fix this and that'll make everything better. Right. Right. Yeah. That's the promise I think of anxiety disorders and OCD is that if I can make sure I'm never going to have a panic attack, I'll be fine. Everything That's else is going to problem. Yeah. Hey, gravy, man. Yeah, I get it. I yeah. actually hear people say that on a radio. If I could just, if I could just figure this one thing out, yeah. whether it, whether it's an, you know, an OCD subtype expressing or a, a panic symptom or whatever it is, if I could just figure this one, just this one, this is the one thing. Yeah. Mm. But it's then a beautiful a lie, isn't it? I think it's it's probably a universal lie. We see it come out in that area, but I'm sure that we all tell ourselves that that universal lie in a lot of different ways. Everybody yeah. in some ways. So which is maybe where there's so much benefit in recovery, because I think the people who have to go through this for one reason or another because of anxiety, generalized anxiety or panic disorder or phobias or OCD or whatnot, that th- they start to see it happening across their lives and they they don't let even as much the cursory emotional states get them off course. Yeah. 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 That's you're correct. That's you're right. Cursory emotional states is a great phrase. That's that's our band name. That's the, that's the disco band. (laughs) (laughs) Cursory emotional states. That's our (laughs) band. That is so good. Colon fire and ice. (laughs) I don't want to let that go. Cursory emotional states is yeah. Okay. That's a band name. I'll take it. Yeah. Or at a, at a minimum, that's a debut album. Sure. Um, yes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> anyway. All right. We're at about the 30 minute mark. So we'll wrap it up. What do you, you how do you want it? So somebody is in the, in the thick of this right now. Yeah. They had, oh my God, something terrible happened or I'm under this, under the gun and I'm right back square one. Mm. What would you tell them? You're always only a step away from pivoting back to acceptance, back to the tools, back to navigating things as they are as opposed to trying to resolve something that can't be resolved. So it's okay. You know how to do this. You've done this before. 
we're just gonna we're gonna practice here we are there's feelings and and thoughts and um and uncertainty and and this is an opportunity here we go i love it one step away from pivoting back to you know back to where you know what you have to do yeah well we'll wrap it up there i can't do any better than that Thank you me. can't are you sure i, I bet you can <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm down the gauntlet here. Um, anyway, that was good. I always love these. We'll be back I again. I, maybe next time we will do a QA. and a Yeah. Yeah. I'll, well, we'll put up questions on Instagram with people and then we'll answer questions. And uh, I love uh, it. Yeah. So anyway, for those of you who are not, I put it up on the screen. For those of you who are not following Ro uh, Lauren, she's right there at the obsessive mind on Instagram. Uh, and if you're not following Drew, he's there. He's at the <laughs> dot anxious dot truth. <laughs> and he's awesome. So go follow him. Yeah, it's going to be good. So we'll put this up on my YouTube like we always do and wherever else you're going to find it. It's great. Put your comments. We'll do our best to answer them as best we can. And we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Lauren. On the flip side. Bye. All right. That's awkward.